two people in the pin contact zone and they're um, stuck in traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Slides up and I've got it. I'm just um, behind you. Behind you yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, good, um, good evening everyone, um, for those that don't know me, I'm um, Kevin Till, member of staff here at uh, Leeds Beckett uh, University and um, we've been lucky, lucky enough to, uh, to invite uh, Joe Baker, uh, Professor Joe Baker over to, uh, to deliver our first uh, Carnegie, Ex uh, Carnegie Exchange winter, winter lecture. So the, the aims behind these lectures are for us to, I guess, share share knowledge within uh, within the areas of uh, within sport and to invite some external speakers in to discuss their, their areas. So as I said, really lucky to get uh, Joe um, over to to give our first first lecture in the, the area. Uh, Joe's a, a professor at, uh, at York uh, York University in Canada and has been um, is a world leader in the, the area of talent identification development has done a, a range of work in, in the area over the last um, you know, 50, 15 years or so. And Joe's going to present around the topic of uh, puzzles, pitfalls and probabilities in the, the pursuit of, uh, of sporting talent and, and hopefully sort of question us in, in relation to this area and uh, hopefully you know, provide a really interesting talk. So welcome uh, Joe, thanks for coming and uh, look forward to the talk. Great, thanks Kev. <laughs> Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Kev, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. I'm hoping that our discussion at the end goes into deeper issues, though. Um, first off, I have to say a huge thank you to Sue and to Kev and the rest of the Leeds Beckett group for inviting me here. Um, this is what I left yesterday morning in Canada. We got our first blizzard of the season. Um, this is what a lake looks like when temperature drops 25 degrees overnight. Uh, that's all the heat from the lake uh, disappearing. Um, this is my very unhappy dog, Ali. Um, Ali, it's going to be okay. It's only for another five months. Um, I'm happy to be here. I don't mind the wet weather. I don't have to wear a jacket. I don't have a toque on. Uh, so everything's great. Um, this is the primary question that has driven uh, my research program for the last 20 years. Um, in a previous life, I was a competitive uh, Ironman level triathlete. And so I was always interested in what are we capable of if we focus hard enough and train long enough. Um, this is performance time in the Boston Marathon over the last 100 and 115 years. I'm missing a couple, excuse me, a couple data points at the end here. But if we were to plot performance in basically any sport, we see this general trend. We're continuing to get better if we plot 100 meter time, if we plot um, uh, performance metrics for team based sports. Continuous improvement is the reality of high performance sport these days. Technology gets better, surfaces that we play in, environments we train in, coaches are getting better. Um, and so for me, the big question that drives us is how good can we get? We know that a lot of things that we used to say are due to uh, genetics or innate ability, the ability to, to read pucks that are being shot at you at 150 miles an hour or uh, intercept a ball moving at rapid pace through space in terms of the volleyball. Uh, the volleyball smash or tennis players who continually serves, uh, serve faster and stronger uh, year after year. These things that we used to dismiss as being, uh, well, 
that's just those people are freaks we can't understand what they're capable of we know that that's not true we know that if we take that tennis player and we give them a badminton racket their ability goes away and so there's something about the specificity of training in that environment that explains this dominance that explains this effect and so for us what this does is it puts the training environment front and center in terms of understanding why elite athletes are able to do what they do and so over the last year I've been on sabbatical and really unpacking this idea of talent because um, talent is this quality that won't go away my clicker doesn't work I don't know why I'm pressing that button um, Public Speaking 101 says you should present your audience with a provocative statement. Here's my provocative statement. How is the most important concept in sport today? Okay, I'm going to defend this and we'll come back to it a little bit at the end. But what I want you to do is, in your mind, think of this question. What is talent? If you had to explain to a parent whether an athlete you're working with has talent or not, how would you define it? Okay, keep that in mind. If I was to ask a dozen researchers what talent is, I would probably get a dozen different answers. It's not a, it's not a quality that we have great operational definitions for, but we love it. We love the idea that we could look at people for short amounts of time and make long-term predictions about their likelihood of success. We have an entire entertainment industry called reality TV that's based on this concept that we can look at somebody singing a song for 30 seconds or hair battle spectacular if you've never seen that you're missing out <laughs> um, that we can look at people for a short amount of time and make long-term predictions about their likelihood of success we do that all the time when we meet new people we make instantaneous judgments am I gonna like this person do I want to continue this conversation uh, when we see our kids or our nieces and nephews, um, we look at them playing with frogs outside and we're like, they're gonna be a scientist, this is amazing, right? We, that's the way our brain works. We look at people doing things for short amounts of time and we make these gigantic leaps in terms of what that means for them in the future. That's what talent is. That's the way we look at athletes as well. For me, why this is becoming and, and remains a critical issue for those of us that work in high performance sport uh, was made real to me when I saw this video. Um, most of you have probably seen this. This is an 18 month old from the Netherlands named uh, Berke van der Meij. Um, I know I brutalized the name, I apologize. Um, this was a video on YouTube about 10 years ago that captured a lot of people's attention. <laughs> amazing, right? We can all look at that 18 month old and go, that's amazing. What's amazing about this is shortly after this video, uh, Berka was signed to a 10 year symbolic contract with a professional football team in the Netherlands. It was symbolic. There were other things that happened. Uh, Berka's um, grandfather was an elite player for the club, so there's some family history there. So it's not just based on this YouTube video. But this is what talent identification looks like in, in a lot of sports today. Earlier is better. Uh, we make massive leaps from little amounts of information. Um, and the long-term consequences for this player are fundamentally and, and, and profoundly affected by these decisions that we make. In principle, talent identification should be simple. Right? We, we look at people on a normal distribution, we pick the people that are at the far right hand side of that distribution, and we select them to move on. The number of stages in our developmental pathway varies from sport to sport, but the exercise is basically the same. We take the people who are at the far right hand side of that normal distribution, and we select them to move on from one stage to the next. If we think about talent in a rough way, if I was to ask you what your definition is, it probably resonates with something like this, that it's a quality or qualities identified at one point in time that can be used to predict success at a future point in time. We look for different things if we're looking at 
18 month olds versus 19 year olds or 25 year olds, but essentially the exercise is the same. What can I take from this person to make a prediction about their likelihood of success in the future? If we um, use that process to predict a future outcome, then that's essentially talent identification. If we um, follow the principle of talent identification, we're basically uh, making two assumptions. One is that talent is a real thing that differs between individuals. I, I think you can make a case for that. It doesn't make sense that all of us are equally capable of it achieving everything in every domain. That doesn't make any sense. Right? It doesn't make sense based on evolution. It doesn't make sense based on if we look around the room and look at people, we recognize that we're different. So the first assumption may be reasonable. The second one though is that we have good ways of measuring it. And I think that one is a little more flimsy. In order for talent to have any real world relevance, we have to meet both of those assumptions. So I'm gonna make a case today that we know very little about talent selection and how to do it well. And all the evidence that we have is that we're not very good at identifying talent, at least in sports that are complex, like rugby, um, uh, football, ice hockey. Uh, we can do it pretty well in sports like rowing, where it's about lever length and, and, and how big an engine can we develop with the appropriate training. But start adding more elements to that, uh, to that complexity, our models become uh, very problematic. If we think about the things that we need to provide to athletes, like when's the right time for coaches to intervene with a, a, a specific type of training? When can we train perceptual cognitive skill, for example? When should we start runners on distance running programs or on a strength and conditioning program? We know a lot more about talent development than we do about talent identification. Are we perfect? No, of course not, because there's a certain level of individual nuance that's necessary. And so we're never going to have a one size fits all model that's going to explain uh, all athletes. But we're probably, we're, we're not probably, we are a lot better at understanding development than we are at identifying or understanding identification. Who cares? Well, um, here in the UK, UK sport spent uh, 20 million pounds on talent identification, not on building facilities and supporting infrastructure for athletes that were already in the system. This was to identify new athletes that had potential to win medals uh, in the London Games. Okay. I'm sure most sports in the room could figure out a way to spend $20 million. Think about sports that don't have that kind of budget. Could we use that money more effectively? And so again, the assumption here is that we're using this money in an effective use of taxpayer dollars. That's one reason we should care. The other reason is these decisions have long-term consequences. So um, these are some data from US basketball. Um, I picked this because it's a really extreme example, but the proportions are roughly the same if we take most sports in North America. So at any given year in the US, there's between four and six million youth playing uh, basketball. In one step of their selection system, uh, if we're talking about how to make it to the NBA, if you don't go to a high school in the US that has a basketball program, and if you're not male, you're not going to the NBA. And that means in one selection step, we go from between four and six million youth to 360,000 youth, because there's 18,000 high school programs in the US. If you wanna to go to the NBA, you almost always have to go to a division one NCAA school in the US. There are 346 NCAA division one basketball programs. And so in two selection steps, we're now down to about 4,500 players. From there, the NBA draft has a two round system. About 50 college players are chosen to participate in the NBA, or at least are eligible to participate. And of those 50, 
only 15 to 20 actually go on to play at the NBA level. Now think about our coaching and our approaches to talent identification. We spend a lot of time talking about these later two groups. But the real cost to our system are those earlier stages. In most sports, when those people are out of the system, they never come back. We don't have, uh, we don't have sport models and infrastructure to allow those people to keep developing at high levels. Once they're removed and deselected from the system, they move on somewhere else. Hopefully it's to another sport, but a lot of times it's not to sport at all. They pick up their video game or they go and play uh, on their iPad or they start watching screens all day and sport never gets them back. So for us, a big question is how can we better manage the risks of deselection? Most sports are great at nurturing and, and, and uh, dealing with athletes that remain in the system, but once an athlete's deselected, normally they, they uh, drop out of our memory. If we're making decisions about capability of athletes early on in their phases of development, um, we're making the assumption that the decisions that we make early on are accurate. And they better be accurate because they have a serious cost. Now, researchers look at talent ID as this theoret theoretical thing. How can we determine whether this thing that we're operationalizing uh, is, is accurately predicted? And we'll look at all the things that coaches could use to predict talent. You know, is it 30 meter uh, uh, running speed? Is it how high they can jump? We have these really complex batteries of tests. And for most people that work in high performance sport, talent isn't, that's not how they consider talent. Talent identification for most coaches is recognized as a problematic thing. I wish I didn't have to do it, but I have to. And so most coaches and trainers and administrators in high performance sports systems look at talent identification as a necessary evil because of resource limitations. It would be great to keep everybody involved that wants to stay involved. I don't have the coaches to do that. I don't have the time on the pitch to be able to do that. And so I've got to make likelihood estimates. I'm pretty sure this person's a better bet than that person. That's how most coaches think about talent ID. It's not that they think it's great or that they think they're perfect at it. It's that this is a necessary evil for most sports in westernized society we just have a resource limitation. If we go to a country like Qatar, for example, they don't have a resource limitation. They have so much money, they could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for every single athlete that they have in their country. Their limitation is people. I was there a few years ago for a talent identification conference and they showed us videos of a talent identification exercise that they did just outside Doha and you would look at these videos and assume that they had some sort of mus uh, muscle disease. They don't have physical education in the school system. People don't do sport recreationally, and so they don't develop fundamental movement skills. Their resource is not money. Their resource is people. So if we look at talent identification as a resource limitation, we position it a different way. We might think about solutions in a different way. So what does the sports science literature tell us about talent ID? And I want to be really careful here and position myself as I'm the guy in sports science that's talking about this. I don't pretend that I'm the person who knows the most about it. I don't even pretend that I'm an important player in this discussion. But I can tell you what the evidence says. Um, I think we need to engage coaches in this discussion. We need to engage parents in this discussion because parents a lot of time make decisions about what they put their kids into. All of that is about talent management. This is just the science part of it. So a couple years ago, we did a systematic review of uh, talent identification research in sport. This is one of my PhD students. Um, and what she did was she did a simple search for big global words like talent, expertise, giftedness, and sport. 
She did it in two big uh, scientific databases for a 25 year period, uh, 1990 to 2015. And no surprise, because of how important talent is, she got a lot of articles, 1,481 uh, separate articles uh, in that search. But if we look at just the best evidence, so we wanna have samples that include skilled and unskilled participants, not just the elites, but the elites compared to a lesser skilled group. We wanna make sure that they're tracking them over at least one year in time if it's just a snapshot then we don't know that the thing they're measuring actually predicts some future outcome we want it to be a lot longer we we're making decisions that if we do an, a talent identification exercise on an athlete at 13 we're probably making predictions 10 years in the future about success but we said okay it has to be at least a year and it had to be published in the peer review um, uh, uh, literature Say what you will about peer review, at least we know it's been through um, review by other scientists and they've said, you know what, this is good enough to get published. When we do that, we go from almost 1,500 articles to 20. So for something that's so central to what coaches do every day, in 25 years, there's been 20 articles. Of those, most of them focused on physical or anthropometric variables. Very few focused on psychological or perceptual cognitive outcomes. Most of them focused on soccer and rugby in the UK. Almost all were from the last 10 years and very few looked at the accuracy of talent identification. Now, over the last year, we've gone back to that original list of 1,500 articles, and then we updated it from 2015 to just a couple of weeks ago, because we we're interested in, if we just look at the overall profile of talent-related research, where are researchers spending their time? Here's what we found. If we look at sex, very few amounts of that research is done with female-only samples. So if we want to develop models of female athlete development, we have very limited research to do that. Yeah, there's a lot of mixed studies, but it kind of assumes that the developmental requirements of females and males are the same, which I don't know if you could make that, uh, that um, conclusion for a lot of sports. If we look at countries, here's the Leeds Beckett juggernaut right there, promoting and publishing all this research in the UK for talent identification. But look at, we can look at uh, Canada there. We're catching up, we will catch up, don't worry. Um, but in general, you can see where the research is being done. And what that tells us is that if we wanna understand the specific developmental context of rugby players in the UK, well, we can't use data from Australia. We can't use data from uh, South Africa. We need to have context-specific data. If we look at sports, we know a lot about football, very little about most of these other sports. And for me, the most interesting part was if we think about the phase of development where we're trying to understand uh, talent identification and the process of talent development. We spend a lot of time looking at adults and adolescents and very little time looking at youth and childhood. Go back to our model of where the greatest cost in our selections are, youth and childhood. We know basically nothing about talent identification and selection in childhood, but it's the greatest cost in our system. So what this means is coaches have limited evidence to make evidence-based talent selection decisions. What about studies that have followed athletes prospectively? How accurate are these decisions that we make? Well, this is a study we did on the professional sports drafts in the US. Um, 
the draft system in the U.S. is is a good one to look at in terms of uh, accuracy of selections because um, they put a lot of money into this. The difference between a first round draft pick and the first round of or a first draft pick of the second round can be tens of millions of dollars. And so, if this is a question that can be solved by money, professional sports would have solved it. The other thing that's neat about the draft is they wait until pretty late in uh, athlete development, uh, the, the pathway to make those decisions. Most of the time it's um, at the end of high school for baseball players or at the end of college for hockey players, basketball players, and football players. And so we get a window of, well, if we wait until late in the process, how good can we be? So we were interested in looking at the accuracy of these selections, and we basically did a really simple analysis. We looked at the, the round the player was drafted in. Players drafted earlier seem to be more, uh, have greater potential than players drafted later. And then we looked at how many games did they end up playing at the professional level. We considered looking at a bunch of different performance metrics, you know, points or, or uh, touchdowns or baskets, those kinds of things. But teams have different strategies for how they use players. Ice hockey is a great example of this. There are positions in uh, professional ice hockey where the person's only job is to intimidate players on the other team. It's hard to capture that in a performance statistic, but if the person is doing their job, they're gonna play games. And so we thought games played is this global metric of are you doing your job? And so what we found was to us what seemed like pretty poor accuracy, Major League Baseball accounts for only 3% of games played with their draft selections. That's not very good. If we wait until late in development, we're still only getting a 3% accuracy in terms of overall variance accounted for. NBA is better, it's 17%, but remember the NBA only has two round systems, so they control the variability of players that they select by only having two rounds. And so for us, two things here. One, this wasn't as strong as we thought it should be. The second thing is, it's not really appropriate for scientists to go back to professional sports and say, you guys are terrible because you only account for 17%. We need to talk to the sports. We need to talk to the coaches and the scouts. The scout might say 17% is awesome. That's exactly what I thought we accounted for. This is a complex outcome that we're trying to predict here. So we can't just use predetermined measures of statistical significance to say whether somebody's good or bad. I have a PhD student now who's looking at all of these teams to try to understand which teams are better than other teams at those selections. So these were the averages of the overall league, but are there teams in Major League Baseball that are better uh, than 3%? What are they doing differently? Another study we did uh, was with a, um, a selection that happened in German handball in um, uh, 2001. Um, German handball, I don't know if you know this, but it's considered one of their national sports. They have two national sports. Um, uh, football, well really they have three. Football, beer drinking, and handball. Okay? So they're crazy about handball. Um, so they have a really sophisticated uh, talent selection process. They go to regions of Germany, they hold selection camps, regional coaches come in, national coaches come in and they evaluate all the players at the camps and they make selections on who's more uh, appropriate to move forward in the system. We wanted to look at the accuracy of that. So because we had data from a group of handball, female handball players that were selected in 2001, we now know where they ended up. Um, 10 years later, 14 of them were on uh, at playing at the national level. And so we can go back now and look at those 58 players from 2001 and see, well, how accurate were the coach decisions at the age of 13 and 14 at predicting that long-term outcome? We needed to have a baseline level of um, accuracy that we could compare against. And if we said that whole group is terrible, 
um, we would have a 70, uh, 76% accuracy because only 24% of the group was actually ended up making it to the national level. Um, that means 76% of them didn't. And so they, uh, the, if we said everyone was untalented, we would have been 76% accurate. Well, if we look at the decisions from the coaches at the national level and at the regional level, we see not a lot different. National level coaches, 79%, 75% for the regional level coaches. Um, interestingly, similar rates of type one and a type two error. A type one error is a false positive where you think the person's talented, but they're really not. Type two is the opposite where they're, you think they're not talented, but they actually are. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is we took short little videos um, of players playing scrimmages during that camp in 2001 and we went out on the streets in a small university town in Germany and we just stopped people on the street and said, hey, watch this video for a minute and tell me if you think this person's talented. The average person on the street in Germany has a 73% accuracy rate. So. What's important here is we don't want to make too much of 73% versus 79% and say, well, hey, look, coaches are getting a lot of money for only 6% more accuracy. That's, that's not important. What's important is um, this final point here, that the random people on the street were more likely to make a type two error. Now, if a coach has one job, it's to make sure talent doesn't leave the system. Type two errors are talent leaving your system. Right? You don't think they're talented when in fact they are. Okay? If, remember, if we go back to looking at this as a resource, uh, efficiency of resource issue, we want to make sure that we're not making type two errors as a coach. So why are we so seemingly so poor at identifying talent? Well, one is that we don't have good talent models. Like I said at the beginning, we don't have any we don't even have good operational definitions for what talent is, right? Talent is everything from the quality that we're trying to develop, the thing that we're trying to identify. In Germany, they call people in the system talents, uh, which confuses everyone. Uh, and so if we don't have a good operational definition of what this thing is, how are we supposed to measure it right? What's the difference between talent and skill? What's the difference between talent and performance? If we don't understand the difference between those words, how do we measure them right? So the lack of appropriate models is a big deal because talent isn't one thing. Think about all the things that could reflect talent in your sport, right? It's physical, it's mental, it's psychological. In some sports, it's cognitive and perceptual. It's all those things at different, uh, with different weights at different phases of development. And so we need to understand that nuance if we're gonna understand how to develop and, and measure this thing. The other problem for us is the absence of any early indicators of what talent is. And the reason for that is the things that we measure early on and the things that feed uh, the likelihood of someone moving on in the system early in development and the predictors of who's going to be successful later in development are not the same thing. And so we have a bias here. Um, when we're looking for young talent, we look for size, power, speed, strength. Um, these things we know are uh, problematic predictors later on. Okay, height in the NBA doesn't predict a single performance outcome. It doesn't mean height's not important. It just means in order to have prediction, we need to have variation. Okay, and so when we're picking athletes for size early on, we end up with a population that's homogenized. Therefore, it's not predictive anymore. We also don't know how talent changes across development. So I don't know if you heard this, probably about three or four years ago now, they came out with um, a study showing that smartphone companies, because of the algorithms that are in your smartphone, uh, smartphone companies like Android and iPhone can predict with a 99.3% accuracy where you're going to be this time tomorrow. 
Um, that's a scary finding, but it's not surprising really because we're habitual creatures. And where we are tonight is probably going to be where we are tomorrow. Maybe tonight's a special, different kind of thing. But most of the time, our days are predictable, and um, from one day to the next, things don't change very much. What they found, though, was when we start to build those model out, uh, where are you going to be a week from now, a month from now, a year from now? The models start to fall apart because our behavior is more complex than that. That's the way we need to be thinking about talent identification. The further it is from the time we're measuring to the time of performance, the less accurate those models are going to be. One of the reasons for that is we don't understand the process of development very well. And here's an example of where we're looking at this from a sports science perspective. And I know there are coaches out there with file cabinets full of athlete profile data that are just sitting there. So I know coaches probably have an understanding and a better idea of this profile than the scientific community does. But us in the scientific community don't know whether peak performance uh, looks like that, where the, um, the, the person is always at the top of their age cohort. When we do cross-sectional studies and we only look at the elites, this is the pattern we assume elite development looks like. We don't really know if it looks like that. When we add the variation, um, we don't know that it doesn't look like that. The continual progressive increase in performance over time. We don't know whether it looks like that. Unpredictable, sporadic, confusing. Um, and so in order to understand the process of development, we need to know what it looks like for all of these indicators of performance that we think go into talent. So we need to capture more noise in the system. So again, it comes back to a point I was making earlier about keeping track of people who are deselected from the system because they're the noise. If all we keep are the people that survive the system, we have a massive survivor effect. We also know that current development approaches are biased. Most of these will be well known to you, relative age effects, um, birthplace or community size effects, socioeconomic status effects. We see disproportionate amounts of people based on these biases, right? Um, uh, rugby league has one of the largest relative age effects that we've ever seen. And the reason is because size and power and strength is so important in that sport, especially early on, right? And so that's a biased approach that we have. Other biases are coach-related biases. What's your attributions about talent, okay? How many people here have heard the buzzword um, from Carol Dweck's work uh, around mindset? Okay, mindset's this powerful uh, uh, phenomenon these days. But it relates to how you explain your athlete's skill level or their performance level. Do you see it as something that's inherent or fixed? Or do you see it as something that's acquired or due to uh, personal growth? So Carol Dweck's done a lot of work in this area. A motor learning uh, researcher named Gabby Wolf has also done a lot of work in this area, bringing people into the lab and manipulating this variable mindset. And what they found was if you see your abilities as fixed, this can lead to feelings of helplessness when things don't go your way. We make negative judgments. We feel more pressure when we feel like things are fixed and outside of our control. Locus of control research in sports psychology reflects the same thing. When we feel like things are outside of our control, we lead to what's called a maladaptive uh, motivation profile. What we want from our athletes is to see things as being within their uh, control. This is a growth perspective. When things don't go well, we persist more. We practice more. We um, feel more satisfied. It's really critical that you recognize that neither of these approaches are correct. Right? Sometimes things are fixed and outside of our control. But when you think about things in one way, 
you have a maladaptive response. And if you think about them another way, you have an adaptive response. What we want is no matter what situation, our athletes are having adaptive responses. So the way we interact with athletes influences the way they think about their skill. So even though the individual athletes are feeling the satisfaction and feeling the frustration or lack of persistence, the person driving that effect is the instructor in all of these experiments. That's what coaches are. Coaches are instructors. We also know that, or we believe that, having a fixed mindset could affect the way that you evaluate your athletes. You believe this thing is, you either you have it or you don't, well then that's gonna affect the way that you think about athletes that don't have that skill, even though it might be trainable. Right now we're looking at other biases that coaches might have. One of my PhD students is looking at this area uh, because of this thing we discovered in cognitive psychology called the naturalism bias. What the naturalism bias is, is um, if I was to ask people in the room what's more important, um, somebody who works hard or somebody who has natural gifts, most people would say, well, I want somebody who's going to work hard. But if we give you two people and we force you to make a decision on which one of these you're going to take as more talented, most people will choose the person with the natural gifts. That's the naturalism bias. It's this idea that we think we're processing information in one way, but in fact, we're, we're, our, our information processing system is biased and open to um, uh, manipulation by the types of information we provide it. And then we have another athlete-related bias that we're exploring in, um, in my lab as well, related to something called stereotype threat which is this idea that, uh, especially important in athletics, it's based around the idea that certain racial groups have performance advantages over other racial groups. So being able to trace your lineage to East Africa, for example, um, is a stereotype that we have about distance runners, West Africa for sprinters. Um, there's no conclusive evidence whatsoever that that is true. But imagine yourself as the only white guy in the Olympic sprinting finals and you look over and see um, seven other people who can trace themselves to West Africa and tell me that's not gonna have a performance effect, right? That's how our brain works. Um, even in the absence of evidence, these things can have powerful real world effects. So how do we improve? Well, the first thing we can do is recognize the limits of our knowledge and the limitations of current approaches. This is a, an example or an analogy that we're working on in the lab right now because people often use forecasting as um, uh, an analogy for what talent selection is. Think about how we do weather forecasting. You know, we know pretty much, if I was to say, you know, what's the weather going to be like um, a year from now? Well, you look out the window and you say, well, today it's kind of rainy. It's been rainy for the last few days. So I think it's probably gonna rain a year from now. Between now and then, you would get more information. You would say, okay, well, no, it's starting to, you know, you probably wait for 11 months and then look for what the data is telling you. Well, no, it's been si uh, sunny for the last five days. I'm gonna adjust my forecast. I think now, I'm, I don't think it's gonna rain so much. Maybe I'm 50-50 now. And then we keep informing that forecast as we get closer and closer to the date that we're trying to predict. That is not how talent selection works. As soon as you tell somebody that they have talent and another person that they don't, you have forever changed the trajectories of those two athletes. They can never be compared again. Because you've given one a better training environment, you've given them positive feedback about talent or that they have it and that this other person doesn't, and you've treated them like apples and oranges. It's a totally different phenomenon. And it makes it really, really difficult to evaluate the accuracy of those decisions. Because we don't know whether a level of accuracy is good because you were right in the first place or because that person was put in an environment that allowed that prophecy to become self-fulfilling.
We also need to understand the implications and risk associated with the process. So this is a matrix that we designed based on the idea that for most coaches, all talent selections don't have the same level of risk. We, we, we searched for an exercise that we could do with coaches to help them understand the risk of this process and how to make better decisions or at least think about this, uh, this exercise in a different way. And so what we did was we, we can measure performance at any point in athlete development and we're going to use performance to make assumptions about potential because we don't have good measures of potential. But we can look at those athletes that we're measuring and try to place them on this grid. Okay, so what we do with coaches, we bring them in uh, to the lab uh, or, we, or we go to their uh, coaching environment and we say, okay, Here's your list of athletes you're considering for the national team or for the next level of talent identification. Place them on this grid. Now, one and nine are easy, right? Somebody who's at a low level of performance is going to be um, deselected from the system. And if they have a low level of potential, that's not a problem. Somebody who's got high potential currently performing at a high level is going to stay in the system. No big deal. The system is working for those two groups. The majority of people that you're going to evaluate in your practice are in between those two groups, right? So talent selection is never a yes or a no question. It's always a yes and a no and a whole lot of maybes. So when we go through this exercise and we have them place people on this grid, it's recognizing the fact that this is a complex exercise that we're asking coaches to do. Right, so our medium risk people are two, four, five, six. Medium risk because they have the potential to clog the system. Somebody who's got a medium level of performance or a medium level of potential, medium's not gonna cut it at the high performance level. So their risk is that they clog the system and might take the place of somebody who's better suited. Our high risk groups are Number three, because they're performing at a high level now, but their potential is terrible, so they're taking a spot from somebody else who deserves it. And seven and eight, because they're currently underperforming, but they really have the potential. And so when we do this exercise with coaches, they start to look at their athletes in a different way. And the real power is when you bring coaches and assistant coaches together, or maybe scouts if you have scouts, and you get them all to uh, rate players on this grid and you look for inconsistencies. Well, why do you have that person as a three when I have them as an eight? Um, that discussion doesn't happen when we have coaches make these decisions in isolation, right? So the other thing about this grid is we have no idea what the right answer is. So it's just a tool for discussion. The other thing that I think is a real opportunity for coaches in this area is to plot their path to improvement. Right? Recognize that not only is your sport, and I, have, I don't know what sport you're in, but I would guess that it's probably terrible at identifying talent uh, just based on what most of the evidence suggests. Don't see that as a, as a, a slight against you. See it as an opportunity because everyone is terrible at this. Right? Think of the professional sports draft. If this was a question that could be solved by money, it'd be solved by now. It's because people aren't looking in the right place. They're not doing the appropriate research. If to, nothing else, to be able to draw a line through something and say, this doesn't matter. So we wanna have longitudinal research where possible. We wanna evaluate accuracy. What happens a lot of times is Coaches and, and trainers and scouts will collect a lot of information and they'll make a decision, but they never close the circle by looking back, how accurate was that decision? Um, we need to close the circle more often. So here's a couple steps that we've uh, developed through consultation with some coaches in the Canadian system about how to develop a more effective athlete ID and selection system. Number one, what are you gonna measure? 
as we said earlier, most people are looking here. Physical, anthropometric, physiological outcomes. They're easy to measure compared to psychological things or perceptual cognitive things. We know uh, vertical jump is an accurate predictor of explosive power. Okay? We don't know that a grit scale is going to actually predict how gritty you're going to be from this point on. But that's where the value is. That's where the potential is. Because people aren't looking here. One of the things that we're starting to explore in our lab is not static psychological factors, but what psychological factors can we use to predict a person's training experience from this point forward? We start to look at these things as interactive variables. Um, one of the things we're developing in the lab is something we're calling training self-efficacy. Can we predict who's more likely to figure out a way around obstacles to their training? Uh, you know, I've got a flat tire on my bike. Well, who's still there? Who figures out a way to make that training session happen? If we could measure that at seven, you have to think that's going to predict something 10 years later. The quality of the training that person's going to put in over that period, you would think would be better, um, uh, at least more of it. Right now, we have a big project in the Canadian system looking at something called self-regulation, which is essentially your ability to uh, regulate your own learning uh, and your own training. It involves three elements. Metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. Strategic action, which is planning, monitoring, evaluating. Uh, who are your athletes that are going home thinking about how good that session was? Or what do I need to do tomorrow to make that session better? Uh, that's basic self-regulation. Uh, how many athletes rely on their coach to do that? And if your athlete's not there on, uh, uh, early for practice, it's because their parents ha uh, had to drag them out of bed. Well, that tells us a little bit about self-regulation. It tells us about their motivation to learn. There's only been a couple of studies that have looked at this longitudinally, but they found that if they uh, measure self-regulation in adolescence, it predicts who's more likely to be successful as an adult. And the reason for that is people who self-regulate control their learning environment better than people who don't. They get better grades in school. They have better performance in sport. They think about their life in a different way than the person who relies on someone else to regulate their training. They're more successful because they control their learning environment. One of the workshops that we do in Canada is uh, working with national team coaches who see that their job is to regulate every element of their athletes' lives and to try to get them to move some of that regulation onto the athletes. Maybe it's by developing a training log that they have to fill in so that forces them to monitor and evaluate. Maybe it's giving them autonomy over decisions about what drills we're going to run because it gets them to think about practice in a different way than if the coach just designs everything for them. But the focus is on moving them towards uh, more along the lines of regulating their own training because there's something powerful in getting them to think about their development in that way. Very few people are looking at perceptual cognitive factors like quality of decision making. We spent a bit of time today talking about uh, game intelligence. A lot of coaches talk about game intelligence. This player's got it, this one doesn't. We don't have good ways of measuring that. Even if it's subjective uh, coach uh, opinion about game intelligence, let's start measuring that, see how accurate it is at predicting long-term outcomes. Um, even if it's, like I said before, even if it's just to draw a line through something and say, no, nope, that doesn't predict anything, we're still moving forward. Uh, especially in these last two areas because the world isn't looking here. We know that perceptual cognitive factors are important at the end of the skill development journey. We know that um, stable gaze behavior reflected in this thing called the quiet eye predicts success in a lot of aiming sports. But nobody's looking at, well, where does the quiet eye come from? Can I measure it at 13? Um, we're only looking at the end of the journey. Maybe there's something important early on that we can identify uh, to, to understand this outcome better. Then we need to think about the best time to measure it. 
So a few years ago, Kevin and, um, uh, and a bunch of us from around the world were part of uh, Rugby Football Union, brought a bunch of people in uh, to talk about specialization and athlete development. And it was one of those very rare times when all the scientists in the room agreed and all the practitioners <laughs> agreed. Um, and we all agreed that when possible, we need to delay specialization for as long as we can and try to avoid selection until the very last moment. And it was one of those things where everybody kind of patted themselves on the back and then almost in an instant, everyone agreed that's never gonna happen. I take my hat off to, to Rugby Union because they actually made it happen. But we looked at this and said, this isn't gonna happen because not only are we dealing with an individual sport, but if Rugby Union waits until 16 to make their selections, their good players are gonna be snapped up by Rugby League or by soccer. And so we thought, we created this pessimistic environment where I don't, it's a great idea, guys. I don't think it's gonna work. It did work. It was, it was amazing how uh, Rugby Union implemented the recommendations of that group. But that came from science about when is the appropriate time to measure these outcomes? When's the appropriate time to make selections? How are you gonna measure it? We always wanna get the best, highest quality data possible. Most of the time that's longitudinal, prospective kind of studies. That doesn't mean you can't do something now. Right? Measure your athletes this year, compare them to last year if you have it, next year if you don't. Create your own long-term study. At the end of the day, we're informing your coaching as much as we're informing the rest of the world. Right? So if we make you a better coach, then more people are going to say, hey, what's he doing that's different or what's she doing? Uh, and then we, the system changes through seeing success as opposed to seeing difficulty. Most of the time we want to get valid and reliable, objective kinds of indicators. But I would say for some things, especially softer qualities that we don't really have a good understanding of, go with your gut. Measure your coach's eye, your intuition, your opinion that you can't, I can't tell you why I think this person's better, but I think they are. Let's track it. Let's see if you're, let's see if there's something there. Let's be careful not to throw coaches out just because they can't define what it is they're measuring as being inaccurate. They could be perfect and, and very accurate at measuring this outcome. They've got enough, ex or they have enough experience. Let's not throw out experience for lack of objectivity. For me, the critical one here is uh, developing partnerships between practitioners and researchers. And I think here at Leeds Beckett is probably uh, the best place in the world where we've seen the, the power of that relationship with the stuff that Kevin, Ben, and, and the rest of the group has been doing with Rugby League and Rugby Union. There's nowhere in the world that has this kind of relationship with, uh, between practitioners and researchers. We need to see more of that, right? Um, the Australian system used to be great at it. Their system's imploding now. Um, th they're not gonna lead uh, I think there's a real opportunity here for the UK to lead in terms of this kind of relationship. Not only is it positive for the practitioner because they're getting their own questions answered, they're driving the research agenda. Uh, it's important for the, the researchers as well because their, their work is actually being used. Uh, and that's what we're here for, right? We're here to get uh, work done that's actually gonna have some real world value. So I said we'd come back to this um, that it's the most important concept in high performance sport today. And I think that's because we still have systems that are designed with this concept as the foundation, right? We start to identify it early because that's the way our systems have always worked. We don't have the resources. Uh, we don't have coaches that are specialists in uh, childhood and, and youth development. And so we keep doing what we've always been doing. Our funding for the system is based on the assumption that talent's a real thing and that coaches are good at identifying it. If I was to say to you, instead of assuming that you know what talent is, assume that you don't, how would you change the way you approach your coaching? I bet most people would change it, but we don't. We think we're good at it. In the absence of evidence that 
we're terrible, we just assume, no, I'm the, I'm the exception, I'm the one that's good. But how would you change the way you talk to your athletes when you deselect them if you assumed that you were poor at identifying this thing? And remember that this approach has high costs, especially early in the system. These people never come back to sport, at least at that level, uh, once they've been deselected. Very, very rare. And so how do we manage that better? One way is forget about talent. If talent exists, we're terrible at measuring. Your messages about talent may be harmful. So it's important to foster that adaptive growth mindset, but be realistic. You don't tell everybody you can be anything you want to be if you train hard enough. That's not a positive social message as much as Erickson might think it is. It disadvantages people who need more help, who need more resources. Focus on quality of training and practice because this is where your greatest impact is going to be. One of the things that we're trying to do with our research group in Canada is to be the bridge between what people in the high performance research area are doing and the practitioners. And so we have a group of, uh, of about 15 grad students that meets every two weeks and all we do is talk about questions that people have in this area. So if you have a question reach out. I know you've got great resources here with Kev and with, with Ben, but if you want a different opinion, if you want to start things rolling, reach out, email, Twitter, uh, whatever it is. That's what we're here for. Uh, and with that, I'll just say thanks. And um, yeah, happy to take questions about any of this stuff or athlete development in general, uh, whatever you like. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, really fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to open up some questions uh, in the room for maybe 10 minutes, uh, and then after that, there is coffee available um, to have a bit more in informal discussion as, as well. Um, so over to you, Ben. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. If, if we don't know what we're looking for in talent, if, should the approach be to be a shot run and measure every single thing that we can? But then if we do that, how do we then manage? Yeah, so the shotgun approach, are you thinking like a machine learning uh, kind of thing where we measure every variable under the sun and then look at what emerges? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, there's, there's a bit of that out there and we had a little bit of a discussion about that this morning. Um, the problem with the shotgun approach is it assumes that we're good at measuring the variables that go into the model. And I think we are for physiological and anthropometric things. I think we're really solid indicators of those outcomes. It's the other ones, I don't think we have those things yet. And so for me, um, analytics to a certain extent becomes this garbage in, garbage out exercise because if, um, if we're not measuring the thing that's important or we're not measuring it in a, in a um, objective way, then we're not gonna it just doesn't have the ability to emerge as a powerful thing and we run the risk of saying well no it's not important but we don't know that because you didn't measure it properly so I, I think there's potential there I would just like to see a lot more movement towards um, operationalizing some of these qualities better like grit for example or resiliency or mental toughness um, killer instinct coachability all these things game intelligence that we hear a lot but we don't have good measures of Sorry? So what, what's the sport that is, there's, there's even like academic definitions yeah. which, which need clarity and understanding, but if you're in a sport, you can't wait for academia to yeah, yeah. create definitions before you do something. Yeah, what I would do is, um, uh, is, is start to evaluate the decisions that you're making as a coach or as a scout. Um, on the one hand, there's the need to have something that's objective and and operationalize, that's the science part of it because we want to understand what the specific mechanism is. 
I think for the coach, as long as they're accurate, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is. And so for me, the more important thing for a coach is how accurate are you? Um, if, you know, if we have no baseline, then we can't track improvement. We can't change our system here or there and, and with the expectation that it's going to get better. I think right now, like I said, we're, we have too many coaches that aren't closing the circle in terms of how they could be using what they're measuring as a way to improve their system. Yeah. Are we so bad at fixing talent? I mean, I'm just thinking about um, football, watching football in Champions League soccer yeah. now yeah. compared to, say, watching high level football 20 years ago. With all the influence of improved coaching, improved sports science, and the end product looks infinitely better to me. It looks like something's going very right. So, are we so bad at it? And isn't the problem that we have is that at the highest level there's only a finite amount of spaces. So you just always lose people in the system. Yeah. I think there's a couple things there, right? One is um, how do we know that it's not improvements in the development system that are responsible for the improvements in the game, right? It, it, it could, we could be succeeding despite a terrible talent selection system because our coaches and, and training environments are so much better. Um, and then the second part is, um, was on the tip of my tongue, and uh, I can't remember. I'll have to go with the elegance of my first. Yeah, you've got being awake all night. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I have a copy of those. So I I just, just see if I can just come back on that. I just yeah. wonder as well whether. I don't know if I'm understanding you right, but does that kind of like there is some sort of magical algorithm out there that we can use if we have enough information to 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 make sort of clever predictions and whether actually what it is is that we're just trying to educate and inform the practitioners at each stage of the process yeah. to, to to make the best decisions in the context they are. Yeah. So it's something that's not predict predictable as much more like kind of just informed decision making yeah I think that's a good way to think about it like if we understood that um, our ability to predict talent at in under 12 year olds is at best going to um, account for 10% of the variance in success and as we move up we, we gain variance well that tells us something about our coaching right it tells us something that we can use now to change the way that we make those decisions. We might make more um, um, alternative arrangements for people that we're unsure of. Those, you know, those um, seven and eights in our, our model, we might say, well, no, we need to have a parallel structure to continue to develop them. Um, I think right now, in the absence of good data to tell us how poor we are at this exercise, we just assume everything's working great. Uh, and so nothing ever gets better. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, one of my colleagues in Toronto is uh, her research area is in positive youth development, and we always have this discussion of whether we can develop positive qualities in youth at the same time that we're developing high performance athletes. Um, and I'm I'm not sure because um, you know on the one hand I would love to be able to say. Yeah, self-regulation is this thing that we could impart to everyone, then they'll be better at school, better at managing their lives, all these sorts of things. But we don't really know how much of self-regulation is a personality trait that is just 
hardwired. Like people who are conscientious, for example, are more likely to be good self-regulators because they're focused on detail. They plan their. So, so the, the point you made earlier about <coughs> data that suggests that adolescents do measure as high self-regulating yeah. are predictive of being adults with depression. We don't know whether that's because by virtue they look at the family yeah. environment and the school that they're in, yeah. or whether it's just one factor. We don't because they didn't measure personality at the same time, and we don't we don't really have a good understanding of a lot of these characteristics that are kind of sold as being highly trainable and modifiable, like grit, like uh, self-regulation, how big a change we can actually make. And the other part of that is the, the Dutch uh, data was adolescence to early adulthood, but when we're talking about a professional football player, do we have to let them self-regulate? Or is it better if the coach does control every element and just say, you need to show up here because the, the plane is leaving, um, or you know these this is the laundry list of things that you need to do for your day, so that you keep all of your energy for the playing field. We nobody's ever explored those kind of things, and so I think there's um, I think there's a difference between the qualities that are necessary for development and the qualities that might be necessary for performance at the highest level. Um, and right now we haven't we haven't really um, joined those two um, pathways up. I've kept in my mind the link for those um, athletes at a high level of performance who are given the washing list of what to do. Yeah. Does that not create the um, transition out of their career problems? Um, yeah, which is a, a million dollar question too, right? It's um, and I think if you read any of the great British medalists uh, results, you start to see that maybe the system is developing some qualities that are going to be negative once they move out of the world of sporting into the world where we don't value those things. So we've tried to operationalize talent, and the way that we've done it is um, is to stop thinking about it as a static thing. Um, none of us are, are static in terms of our development. The clock doesn't start on day one, and we end up here tonight because of a predictable path. Our genes are like switches, and they're being turned on and off based on the environments that we find ourselves in. And so that's the way we need to think about talent. It's almost like we can't tell if somebody's talented until they've spent an extended period in an optimal training environment. That's different than thinking you can identify it at center. Um, there's only a few things that we can make those predictions on, and there's height, limb length, um, fast twitch muscle fibers, a lot of those things you can make stronger predictions on from a, this is what you've got, this is what you're always gonna have. Um, talent is so much more than that. Talent's a, 10,000 different variables and combinations. So I think we've got to, that's how we've got to be thinking about those things. Last question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask something about how do you work out the difference between, it almost seems like we're saying, well, talent is something we measure now to work out whether someone will be selected to a, a top performing team later. But there must be lots of people who have the ability and just would prefer to be fashion models. You know, you know, so maybe this, the people who selected them into the system were right, but they dropped out for a whole bunch of, of different reasons. You know, I, I suppose I, I kind of, I like what, what Julian was saying when he was saying, well, are we that bad at 
predicting talent. So if you if you had to take people in school and try and predict who would become engineers, you know, I'd suggest you'd probably be worse than uh, predicting who could become <laughs> Olympic medalist because there's so many other things that yeah. they could choose to do instead. Yeah, I guess there's always the assumption that you're predicting people who are interested in staying in the system, right? Like in the, the way that I like to look at talent is um, we're never going to know the answer to the question with 100% certainty. And so can we develop and collect evidence that's going to help us build better likelihood estimates for why this person and not that person? And if we do that, then I think a lot of things get better. One is we think about talent in a different way. We're always interested in improving our model so that we can be more accurate the next year. It also provides us with a lot of clarity when, uh, when we're dealing with parents and, and athletes who are unhappy with our decisions. We can say on day one, these are the factors you're going to be evaluated on. And then on selection day, here's the rank, here's where you are, you're, you're not above the, the cutoff. People won't be any more happy with that, but they'll understand it. I think a lot of the pushback that we get from parents and from athletes these days is because our, our, um, the metrics we're using are unclear. And so it's hard for them to understand why, why didn't I get selected? I'm, I'm amazing, how come you didn't see me? Well, no, if you give them a clear indicator of these are the factors you're being evaluated on, um, it also provides them with something that they can go away off the training environment and improve. Um, so I, for me, I think it's all about positioning talent selection as a likelihood estimate. Um, why would you choose this person over that person? It recognizes that we're talking about limited resources, limited spaces on a team. Uh, it focuses on improving models. It does a lot of things right uh, that right now I think, um, I can't really, I, I don't know if it was Ben that said it, but you know, are we just throwing darts at a dartboard in the dark? Well, that, to a lot of athletes, that's what it looks like. Okay, uh, thank you for everyone uh, for, for coming tonight. As I said, we'd like to invite you to some uh, refreshments uh, in, the, in the Acre Room, so feel free to, uh, to follow me and Joe there. Um, but just before we leave, just again, uh, a big uh, round of applause for Joe. For <laughs> uh, specific measure of self regulation. Yeah. It's just for training. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the reason we did that, but I think it was along the same thing that this is a, that we need to start thinking of this as a state characteristic, not a training. Yeah. Yeah.
and if you if you took that measure in a school context or environment like we like we did, you, a lot of our football in our system would, would fail or right. you know would, would score poorly, but if you put them in a football training context environment, they might do a lot better. Yeah, I wonder how much of that is the uniqueness of the football <coughs> team to where it is. Yeah, well, these all the yeah. different incentive structures, abilities, yeah. Yeah. and motivations. Like I can't care about school, but that's how it or you or, or your um, some, something more natural around that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perceptual skills in a football environment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Versus uh, yeah, just sort of IQ or something that might be more yeah. similar to performance in a school environment. Yeah, there's a lot there because the even the physiology stuff would suggest that fitter people are better students to be here. So how much of that better grades in school is because of fitness and how much is because of self regulation. <laughs> If you want that sport specific um, scale, though, yeah, great. Yeah, publish, yeah, publish, yeah. Publish. Okay. yeah. yeah uh, I mean, we're. Um, I just had a, a meeting <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, and, uh, I was a bit team coach. Really, really excited about these kind of things because it's really these kind of things. He probably says stuff that he shouldn't, so he'll say things like.
do you have to recruit minutes? Or how they get out of the side? Same as the John Swiss Fox, that's what I did. That's what you said. How long do we get? The hotel. It's a way. Because you don't go in. 